With that being said, you want to hear the word of God this morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's hold them up high for me and, and give a confession of faith and repeat after me that this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. And my heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And amen. And if you will turn with me in your Bible to first Peter chapter two, verse 21, we're going to pick up where kind of we left off last week. Um, I have a an assignment, I believe, from the Lord this morning to try to summarize the whole chapter of first Peter chapter two. But I'm going to be focusing on um, these last few verses, particularly verse 24 and 25. But everything that I say is going to be um, motivated by everything that uh, Peter has to say in this chapter. And that's a big task. So pray for yourselves that I don't bore the heck out of you and you all stay awake during this process. Um, when all God's people there, somebody say amen. amen. All right. First Peter chapter two, verse 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And here's where I want to focus. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Father, as I've been praying and always pray that this time is for you to let your words speak, let your Holy Spirit move, open up our hearts and our ears and our minds to hear. We came here to hear from you. So please, Lord Father, speak, guide my words, guide my thoughts. Let Jesus be glorified. Let the cross shine this morning. In Jesus' awesome, mighty, wonderful name. And all God's people that agreed said. Well, we've been, we've been in, second, in First Peter um, going through this letter for the past three weeks. This is the fourth sermon in this series of looking at what Peter had to say to the, Peter had to say to the church some years ago. And I entitled this series, How to Live for Jesus While All Hell's Breaking Loose. For those that have been here, you'll understand the backdrop to this letter. You understand that these people that Peter was writing to was going through some really hard times. That they were struggling in their life because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Because they came to the faith in Christ, because they believed in the resurrection of Jesus, and because they decided to live like that was real, their life was flipped, turned upside down. They were living in a time where there was many different gods that were believed in, pagan gods. And, and Nero was the emperor of Rome. And he was having a hard time with Christians because they wouldn't worship his gods and they wouldn't worship him. And because of that, he had a problem and he started to persecute Christians. I won't get into all the depth of it. Go back to the other sermons to find out what the motive was. But there was a fire and he blamed it on them. He said that it was the gods that were punishing Rome because these Christians won't worship our gods. So they were being burned, they were being tortured, they were being fed to lions and thrown into the Colosseum. It wasn't going well for people that believed in Jesus Christ at that time. It wasn't going well for those people that believed in Christ and were living like it was true. And since they were living like it was true, the world was a mess. And as you read in chapter 1, these people were scattered throughout the world. That they had to run for their lives in order to not be persecuted by Nero, in order to not be arrested and thrown in prison or killed or burned alive. They, they left their homes and now they're living in places they're not familiar with. Their, their life was a mess. The people that Peter wrote this to, because they were living in Jesus, all living for Jesus 
all hell was breaking loose. Try to put yourself in their shoes and what life would be like right now if you had to leave your job, if you had to leave your home, if you had to pack up and go somewhere to run for your life because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Picture what you might be feeling. Picture what might be going through your mind about God, about your faith, about tomorrow. I could picture fear. I could picture uncertainty. I can picture stress. I can picture worry. And this is the place that these people were in. And Peter writes this letter to them to help guide them, instruct them, encourage them on how to live for Jesus in the midst of all that trouble. How do they continue to keep their faith in Christ and respond appropriately to all the situations that they were going to be facing? Because how are they supposed to do that and still be on the fire and still be going through trouble? And we've been spending some time. And then yesterday when I was trying to put this piece together, I was really wrestling with it, trying to figure out how to take what was happening to them and try to apply it to our lives today because that's not happening to us. We're not being persecuted to that level for our faith. We're, we're not having to leave our homes, but you can picture what it's like. How are we supposed to take what he tells them to do and apply it to our life with the little bit of stress and trouble that we end up going through sometimes? Right? The, you can't pay a bill. Worried about the car breaking down. You know, somebody gets sick. How do we live for Jesus in this mess? And then it dawns on me, I was in the sanctuary, I was sitting right over there, and I figured I had to start out and explain first what it means to live for Jesus. See, because how do you understand what you're supposed to do if you don't even know what it means to live for Jesus in the first place? We have to begin to first make sure we're right with Jesus, and then we have to make sure that we're living for Jesus before we can decide what to do when it all starts falling apart. And I want to suggest to you that not everybody in this room is living for Jesus. I don't mean to judge. I'm just going by statistics. Statistics tell us that there are a whole lot of believers in Christ to this day. That there are all kinds of people that believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but don't live for him. And they don't live for him for many different reasons. We can spend hours trying to figure out why people believe but won't live. A lot of reasons. But first, let me show you what the difference is so you can decide which one you are. Am I the one that just believes or am I the one that lives for Jesus? Because you have to understand the purpose of the cross was so that we would live for him. The reason he came to die was vast and, and big and great, but he didn't die for the, on the cross so you can live for yourself. He died on the cross so that we can and would live for him. Amen. So what does that mean? What does it look like? Well, basically, to live for Jesus means that you're living your life as if he's telling you what to do, meaning your hopes, your dreams, your desires, the things that you plan are based around what you think Jesus was calling you to do. You see, if you're living for your kids, that means everything that you're doing is being based around your children's best interests, right? My mother used to tell me all the time, I lived for you kids. That means her heart, her mind, her thoughts, her, her attitudes were, were based around me and my sisters and, and what was best for us. So if we're living for Jesus, then that means Jesus in this, is in the center of everything. Why we have the job, why we don't have the job, where we live, where we don't live. What do I do with my time? What do I do with my money? What do I do with my effort? What, you begin by saying, Jesus, what is your will for my life? And you're searching for it. And you're, you're striving to be right in the center of that will because you're living for him. He's the master. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the governor. He's the one that calls the shots in your life. And to live for him each and every day is to fall upon that authority and say today, okay, Jesus, what you got for me? You're searching for his will and then you're doing his will. And not only are you searching for it, you're doing it and you're trying to do it his way. See, there's the shaky part. 
Because doing things that Jesus asked us to do is hard enough, let alone doing it the way he said to do it. It's easy to say, okay, God, I'll do this, but I got this. I'm going to do it my way. But to spend time in prayer, to spend time in thought, to say, okay, God, what do you have for me? And how do you want me to pull this off? Not just his will, but his way. I want to do it for you. And I want to do it the way you want me to do it. Jesus becomes the example for you each and every day. It becomes all about Jesus. Our hopes, our dreams, and our desires are replaced. You see the difference? See, there's the difference between a believer and a follower. A believer comes to the point and they will agree with me that Jesus is Lord. You will agree with me that Jesus rose from the dead. You will agree with me that he was crucified on a cross. You got that. Have no problem with it. The problem is doing the things that he called you to do. Nah, I don't know about that. I, I still have some dreams and I still have some hopes and I still have some desires. And I'm hoping and praying that your will and your way will change and match up with mine. Please, God, come on my agenda. I want to do it, please. And you pray and you do. And most of your prayers are based around him doing something for you. It's never based around you doing something for him. And that's not easy. And that's why so many people don't do it. Because following Jesus is costly. Costs you everything. That's why he says, whoever wishes to come after me must take up his cross and follow me. He says, if anyone wants to follow me, you have to take up your own instrument of self-death. Because you're going to have to die to some things if you want to follow me. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but no son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Sometimes following Jesus means you're giving up some stuff that you cherish like your comfort. We have been called by God and by Christ to be followers of Jesus. That is our call. Or another way of saying it, we have been called to live for Jesus. And that's what they were doing. And that's why they were being persecuted. Because they wouldn't burn the candle to Nero. They wouldn't worship the other gods. They wouldn't do what the world was calling them to do. They put Jesus first. And because they put Jesus first, it cost them a whole lot. So if we're going to understand how to live for Jesus when all hell is breaking loose in our life, first make sure you're living for Jesus in the first place. First make sure that you're moving in that direction and what you're doing is actually his will. You see, he says that in this letter. He talks about what good is it if you suffer (laughs) when you're doing things your own way? There's no there's no good with that. If you suffer for doing the right thing, okay, then it's commendable. And what he's hinting at to them, because they would have understood that what they were doing was what God was calling them to do. And because of that, they were in trouble. And I'm sitting here and I want to call you all this morning to stop being believers, but start being a follower of Jesus. Start living for him because that's the only place we're going to find our hope. Not in believing, but following. That's where it is. It's not easy. It's going to be hard. It tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow, so that you will follow in his steps. Living for Jesus means you're following Jesus. He's guiding your thoughts, your mind, and your direction. Or another way of just saying this, life is not all about you anymore. Oh, let me even, let me make that even better. Be fair. Life is not all about us anymore. When we begin to live for Jesus, life does become all about him. All about him. So if I'm going to share this message on how to live for him while it's falling apart, I got you got to understand what it means. I'm not saying how to believe in him. Because that's easy. Just sit there in your room and pray that he'll solve the problem. How to believe in Jesus when all hell is breaking loose. Pray. Jesus fix it. Jesus change it. <laughs> Jesus do something. Does that make sense? Because you're just believing. But if I'm going to live, it's okay. It's all falling apart. What do you want me to do? How am I supposed to respond? 
Does that make sense? What am I supposed to say? See, believing God, fix it. Following, what do you want me to do? This is an issue. And I don't know what to do. But I know you do. Show me. Isn't that good? I'm serious. I know you're not going to hear this on YouTube. And you're not going to hear this. You're not. But this is the truth of the gospel. When we're born again, the purpose of the cross is so that we would live for him and we would know how to live for him. Or another way of saying that, the purpose of the cross is that we would live a holy, righteous life. That's why Jesus died. That was the whole purpose of it. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter what denomination you're from. I know we're in here mixed from different religious backgrounds, Pentecostals, Baptists, Lutherans, Wesleyans, some Catholics. It doesn't matter. No matter if you if you are a part of a serious biblical Bible theology following people, you come to the conclusion that God calls everyone to believe that believes in him to live holy and to be righteous. The matter we might debate how it happens and when it happens and, you know, how much holiness you could have and how much holy. We might even debate what holiness is, but we do not debate the fact that that's what we were called to do. Is to be holy and you can't be holy ever until you begin to follow him first. There's a cart before the horse type thing. It starts with a decision that I will believe he rose from the dead. Then the holiness part comes from I'm going to start with the next the decision is I'm going to live for him. I'm going to rearrange my thoughts and my minds and my attitudes, not based upon what I think or how I feel, but based upon what he thinks and what he feels. And I think that's why this piece of scripture jumped right out to me on verse 24. Because it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Meaning, it's telling us that the purpose of the cross wasn't so we could be forgiven, although we do get forgiven. And the purpose of the cross wasn't so much so that we would end up in his kingdom, although we will end up in his kingdom. And the purpose of the cross wasn't so that you would be happy, although you can find peace. The purpose of the cross is because he wanted to change you. He wanted to do something to you so that you can live for righteousness. His death and resurrection healed us of our sinful nature. We're beginning to change. We, we got, if you think COVID's bad, die with unconfessed, unrepented sin in your life, and you're going to find out how much you really needed Jesus in your life. He died to heal us. This healing is not physical. He's not talking about COVID. He's not talking about cancer. By his stripes, you've been healed of that sinful nature inside of you. That's why I've been calling it the born again experience. Why I've been talking about being born again a lot lately. Because we're living in a world that has no idea what Christianity is. We've turned it into a religion when it's a conversion. It's a spiritual birth. When we come to Jesus Christ, something actually happens to us. He, he deals with that sinful nature that we got from the moment we were born. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Heal me. Because I came to you because I'm a mess. I came to you because there's something wrong with me. I, I needed forgiveness because I'm going to be judged. But, but Lord, don't keep me a mess. Do something to me. Has Jesus done to anything to anybody in this room this morning? Amen. Called us to live holy and righteous and, and just. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we can be forgiven. No, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we've been healed. That, that, that nature that's all about you. That one that says me, myself, and I. Your own holy trinity that goes on. He says, no, if you put your faith in me, if you'll trust in me, you will be born again. I will give you the Holy Spirit if you set your mind on what the Spirit desires. You, you, does that make sense that before Christ, we can't live holy ever? Before you're born again, you can't live for Jesus. You can care less about living for Jesus. Truly, you don't. If your life is still all about you, get step one right. Come to Jesus Ask him to save you. Ask him to 
to, to spiritually birth you, ask him, Lord, I need to be born again because I'm still focused just on me. And I'm hearing your word says it's supposed to be focused on you. Do something to me. Do something to me. Oh, I need you to, to do something to me. Because we understand on the cross he'd done something for me so that he can do something to me. He can change me. He can set me apart. He can sanctify me. He can change my heart from a, a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. He can change me from someone who is so self-focused to someone who could just be focused on him and his cross. Some of better praise Jesus for that. And the thing is, we get to do that. Forget having to do that. I, I understand. I understand. In the beginning phases of my walk, when I was taught, taught about the call to holiness and the call to righteous living, it was a struggle because it seemed so hard. It, it seemed so impossible. It was so far from my understanding. But when I began to understand what it was, when I began to understand that I can be everything that God created me to be, I started saying, I don't have to be holy. I get to be holy. I get to be healed. I get to change. I get to go through a transformation inside of my life. And I so want to be transformed because it, when I look in the mirror, I don't always see something that looks real good. And I'm not talking about my handsomeness because I am handsome. Ain't that right, beauty queen? <laughs> Ain't that right, Marvin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is some serious stuff, and I know it's heavy because the call to holiness is always a heavy topic in the church. We, I don't know why, but it has turned into like, ooh, be careful. But no, I want you all to live for Jesus. I want you all to experience that healing that goes on inside when we come to Jesus. I want us all to die to sin so that we can live for righteousness. There's not a, am I the only one? And Jesus gives us hope that that can happen. I don't have to stay broke, busted, and disgusted each and every day of my life. Don't let them lie to you. Because you change. You go through a process. And here's the thing. That call to holiness, that call to righteousness should, in, could, should intersect every area of our life, Amen. regardless of what's happening. In this letter here, they're being persecuted by Nero. Their life is a mess because of this man. And what does he say? Submit to all the governing authorities. Submit to the king. There is no authority that has been put in place that, that isn't established by God. If God was really ready to do something about it, he would do something about it. But I'm asking you to do something about it and behave appropriately. Even though, even though the person that's causing the, even to the person that's causing your problem, that's hard, isn't it? How many people have somebody in their life right now making your life hard and miserable? Anybody want to show a hand? I hope it's not me. I hope it's not me. But it's, there's always somebody. And he says, even to that person, you have a responsibility to act accordingly. To Nero, the one that just killed my friends. The one that I'm running from. I need to submit to him and, and do what Jesus did because he talks about what Jesus did. He said he, after he was insulted, after he was beat, after he was hurt, he, he didn't fight back. He stood there and did what he called us to do. And that's turn that other cheek, which we all, including myself, struggle with. He said, go the extra. If someone forced you to go an a mile, go the extra. And what did Jesus do? He took that cross, he put it on his shoulder, and he went the extra mile all the way to his death. And he says, he's our example, and that's how we're supposed to live too. And it's the only way to live if you're going to make it through it when all hell is breaking loose. Because when you don't, the hell just gets worse, doesn't it? When you, when you act ungodly... In a painful and stressed out situation, it doesn't fix the situation. It, it just makes it worse. I want to give you an example. I don't know if it's a good example. 
because it's political in nature, but I'm not picking a side. It's just a good example. Uh, during, and, and during the election, after Biden had won, there was a, a, a storming of the Capitol. You remember? All the protesters showed up and they broke into the Capitol, you know, because they were angry. They were mad. You can't do this. So they broke the law and broke into the Capitol. And I'll be honest with you, I was struggling because I was like, go get them. And then I'm reading the scripture yesterday and I'm like, oh my, I think I was wrong about that. Because did it make situation better for them? No, I was reading in the newspaper, in the, in the, on the, uh, the internet the other day, a few of them been arrested. Now they're getting prosecuted. Did it make the situation better for them? No. Whether I agreed with what they did or not, that's definitely not what Jesus would do. Everything we do, if we're going to be righteous and holy, must be under the guise of what would Jesus do since he's our example. And Jesus allowed them to crucify him. I guess we have to decide somewhere along the line what kingdom are we living for? Because I want you to understand, our only hope is in Jesus. Our hope is not in the government. If you're expecting the government to change the situation that we're in, ooh, wait, we have been in? Ooh. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, no matter. If you're a stout Democrat, you believe in that the Republicans are going to solve your problems, really? They've been trying ever since I was a kid. I haven't seen any change. And if you're a Republican and you, you think the Democrats are the problem, are you really trusting in Nancy? Like, really? Do you got hope that tomorrow, somewhere along the line, she's going to make a good decision? It doesn't matter. Biden's not your problem. And Trump is not your answer. Jesus is. Jesus is. Jesus is. They are not going to make this world better. I do not care. I, I, they, the world, no. No. Look what they did with the COVID. We don't even know what to believe anymore. One of the most, one of, one of the most, Dire situations we are all in right now with this virus. And we are so divided because they won't tell the truth. And we don't even know who's doing the lying. But someone has to be lying. Now we choose who we want to believe because we're adults. And, and you got to make a decision. You do. But come on, how can we end up on two sides of the coin? They're lying to us. All of them. They don't care about you. You think they care about you at all? No. The only one that cares about you is Jesus. And when he comes back, I'm here to tell you, everybody's going to have a problem. And how we behave in this time matters. What we do in this time matters. Because if any, anyone agree with me that the world's falling apart right now, we were in Bible study the other day and we were talking about different things. And, and my brother Cece said, do you think that we're in the end times? Well, yeah. We're always in the end times. Do we believe it's getting closer now than it's ever been? Yeah. It's getting bad. But you know what the hope for the world is? You. The world is not going to get better because of who you vote for. The world is going to get better if you start behaving correctly. The hope for this world is that we begin to live righteously and holy in the midst of everything that's going on. Because he has appointed you and he's appointed me as a royal priesthood and a holy nation. We are standing in the gap for this messed up world. And if you believe the world is ending, get busy. If you believe that the world is ending and Jesus come back, come back any minute and you don't have time to serve him, get busy. You're going to tell me you believe Jesus is coming back and this whole side of the room is going to go to hell and you got stuff to do?
You can, oh, the world's a problem. They're lying to us. Well, man, stop acting a fool. I say that because if you, even if you had the time, if you're not behaving correctly, you're unusable. Oh, I'm sorry. Better leave pray. I got wound up on that one. <laughs> let me let me explain this to you, so you know I'm not judging anybody in this room. There was, and I'm going to get real personal about something that had happened in my life. I'm taking a risk with a bunch of people that some know me and love me and some hearing me for the very first time. Some years ago, I was at Woodlawn Church in the Nazarene. I wasn't called to ministry yet. I was just a person in the church wanting to serve. So the pastor had given me this awesome responsibility to do what Stephanie does. I, I, I gave the announcements. I got up and I welcomed everybody to the church and I shared the announcements and all the things that were going on. I felt so good about myself, right? Up there, serving God. But I used to spend some time with my pastor and in a conversation with him, uh, and before you make a judgment, let me finish the story. Um, I shared with him some things that were going on in my life, some things that shouldn't have been there. I was just asking him for prayer, you know, and he did. He prayed with me. But then he told me that I couldn't give the announcements anymore. Right? I messed with your head right there. And I asked him why. And he said, you have to take care of that in your life before I let you back up on that stage. Now, if you're thinking he was wrong for judging me, that is not what went through my head. Well, the reason I didn't get mad for him doing that is because he was right. Why do you get mad when God, someone points something out that is so wrong that we should know better? And I was brokenhearted. What I was broken about was that because I could not or would not get my act together, the church couldn't use me. Broke my heart. I walked out of there like just, I can't believe that. That I can't be used. I can't, I can't get up here and I, I can't say something to the congregation about something that's going to happen in, in a few weeks because I'm acting a fool. Now, I have two options, don't I? I could have just got mad at the cat pastor, went. I can't believe he judged me. Judge me, tell me what I, I could have, which is probably would have emptied out half this room. But I didn't. I walked out of there and I told God, never again am I going to be living in such a way where the church can't use me. Now, I knew God could always use you, right? God could always do matter. He used all kinds of people. I wasn't worried about that. I was worried about the church couldn't use me. The church couldn't use me. They couldn't, and I was, oh, gosh, stop. Help me, Lord. Change me. Do something. Take it out of my life. Make me, I want to live, I want to, I want to be usable. And once I became a pastor, that, that concept never lost my mind, never left my mind. And I've been in so many conversations over the past 16, 17 years of looking at lists of people. you got 200 people in your church, but you can only use 10. You can only use 10 because the rest are doing this and they're doing that and they're, they're doing the other thing. And you just got to wait till the, till the winter's over, till summer's over. When summer's over, oh, I can't, whoo, I'm good. summer's over. Oh, summer's coming. I let everything stop. And then you have those that have so much free time, but you can't, you can't put Jason up there. Everybody knows Jason. You got two girlfriends, a wife on the side. <laughs> I, was, I was faking the girlfriend's getting Gina. He had no girlfriend that I know of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to preach to you this morning. We have to remember the purpose of the cross. Did we forget? Or were we just told wrong? Especially now. 
I, I'm amazed by how many people have been coming to me and telling me, man, I'm so, I'm so grateful that you've been telling the truth. It's not out there. And I'm what do you mean it's not out there? What are you talking to me? People aren't saying this? What are they saying? So I got on YouTube. I was like, ooh. <laughs> Turned it, ooh. <laughs> ah. It's almost as if Jesus came just to make you happy. Come to Jesus because he's going to give you all your desires and all your hopes and all your dreams. He, 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 no. He called you to follow him and that's a costly endeavor. But it's the most awesome endeavor when you do it because it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. When I got that together, and I because I met with my pastor over that for a while and we talked about it. And I remember the day he said, you, 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 can, you get up there, give announcements again. In fact, it wasn't even that, if I'm telling the truth. Uh, I, men's ministry leader, had stepped down and he got called to ministry. So he was moving to be a pastor of a church. So it was open. I wasn't given, I wasn't given announcements yet, but I was definitely dealing with the issues. And I came to him in the office and I said, Pastor, I, I believe God is leading me to take over men's ministry. And I want to do that. And he told me no. And um, I walked out. I got five feet down the hallway. And I said, no. I went back in there. I said, what's, what's in my life right now that's making you say no? And he said, well, I'll be honest with you. I, didn't, I don't know. I said, Pastor, give me a shot. I promise you. I won't let you down. I promise you. No one's going to discover something tomorrow. There's no rock that someone's going to turn over. I promise you. I will serve God. I will serve this church and I will do it with his best to my ability, with the best righteousness and holiness. Jesus will be my center. I'll let you hold me accountable to everything. And it changed my world because at that moment he said, OK, I'll let you do it. And it changed my world because from there I ended up knowing I was called to ministry to be a pastor. And somehow, some way, in God's humor, he takes this Brooklyn, New York guy and he brings him down to Excel Church in Nazarene. Where some people right now are just so excited about what they're hearing. And there's some like. <laughs> That's not why I came today. I came today to be told that everything is going to be good. I came today to be told everything's going to go well. I came today to hear from God. And hopefully that you have. Because he's called you to follow him. He's called you to live for him. And he died so that you can do that. You see, because if it wasn't for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I could have never have changed. It isn't so much... That we're supposed to balance our morals or we're supposed to, you know, make sure we do right and do wrong. Without the death and resurrection of Jesus, without that healing, you cannot and will not change. Period. You can't do it. It takes the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life to make that happen. Period. Period. So the very fact that I'm not who God wants me to be. But I'm not who I used to be attends to the fact that by his wounds, I have been healed. Is anyone in here can say that? By his wounds, I have been healed. He's not finished with me yet. He still has some work to do. He's missing a couple of spots. But today is going to be the day that I open that up for him to work on because I want to live for Jesus. Amen. And I want to be Holy, I want to be righteous. I want to be all that God called and created me to be. That could be the day right here where you come to God and you say, God, keep working. I, I know what you're saying. I got a spot. I got to deal with it. I need your strength to help me deal with it because I've been trying to deal with this for a while and just can't do it. Would you do this for me? Guide me, teach me, change me, mold me, make me. Remember the purpose of the cross. Is that not the purpose of the cross? Yes, it is. Embrace your calling and embrace your purpose. We need to 
get it together. And then another one I'll end. Is we need to understand that everything I said happens over a period of time. It begins in a moment. It begins the moment you decide to say, Jesus, yeah. That's when it begins. But it's a constant growth process. If you remember from last week in the beginning verses, it says, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. This is a process. We are to be striving to grow deeper and deeper and holier and holier. We're constantly opening up our lives to God and saying, find something in here that needs to be dealt with. If, if six, seven months has gone by and you haven't felt the need to kneel before God and ask for forgiveness and ask for strength and ask for cleaning. Oh my, do that today because that's where you grow. Let me give you an example. <laughs> My wife told me to do this. This is a good one. We got this plant. Can everybody see this plant? I, I, I need Beverly. I know. I need Beverly to use her phone one day and take a picture and tell me what kind of plant that is. But we've had this plant for about five years. It's true. The church gave this to Janana for a Mother's Day gift. And that's exactly what it looked like. Five years ago. That's a sad looking plant, isn't it? You can't look at that plant and not know something's wrong. Something's wrong. I don't know what it is. We tried everything. We've tried overwatering it. We tried underwatering it. We tried putting it outside in the sun and we tried putting it in the shade. We, we've moved it all around the house. Janan won't give up on it. I'm ready to. I know there's a parable where Jesus talks about something like that, a plant that won't grow. And he says, we'll give it another year or two. If not, we're going to cut it down. We're going to throw it away because it's a waste of time. You know the parable I'm talking about, Jesus. That's Jesus' words, that there's a period of time where you got to stop looking just like that. Now, we start looking like that. But we know this, from what I understand, this plant is supposed to be one of the easiest plants to grow. <laughs> That's what we were told. They said, just give it some water and watch it sprout. <laughs> We've been watching for five years. <laughs> when we come to Jesus. We are expected to grow. Some grow faster than others. Right? But growth should. Give me at least one more leaf. <laughs> you can't help but look at it like you just look. It's like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. be a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Don't be that. Does anyone want to be that? I don't. And we don't have to. That's what makes the cross so special. You don't have to. You can embrace everything that God has. Because by his wounds, we have been healed. The door has been opened. That disease of the sinful nature that is keeping you back can be healed. Amen. We don't have to die broke, busted, and disgusted. We don't have to die like that plant. But what we do have to do is make a decision that I want to live for Jesus regardless of the cost. Two, we need to make a decision that I'm going to come to God and Christ for his Holy Spirit constantly. And I'm going to constantly look for those things in my life that are keeping me from being able to do and be what God wants me to be. He didn't call you to just sit there. He called you to get busy. The world is a mess and it needs you. And it needs me. 
It needs us. Excel and Marol, Alabama needs us. It does. Because there's nobody else out there that can point them to the only truth, and that is Jesus. And it's so hard to point them to Jesus when you're too busy. And it's so hard to point them to Jesus when you're living so, so wrong. And sometimes we're living so wrong and we really do know better. It's something when you don't know, when you just get caught one day in a sermon, and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. That's, that, that's going to happen your whole walk with Jesus. But some things are just so obvious. When I was a Marine, they had this charge called uh, uh, unbecoming, uh, behavior unbecoming of a Marine. I think it was like Article 32 or something like that. I had gotten in trouble once. I didn't do anything wrong. Like there was no rule that said thou shall not do that. We were hazing somebody. We tied them up, <laughs> gagged them. <laughs> we did. Tied them to a broomstick. <laughs> Hung them from the ceiling, swang them around. We, we really did. But there was no rule that said thou shall not do that. <laughs> not lying. That's what we did. Took some spray. Put on his boots, lit him on fire. But he was still in his boots. So we did it, we did it, we did it. And I got in trouble. But there was no rule that they could go to and say, this is, no, he, 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 there wasn't any. So I got charged with behavior on becoming a Marine. What that means is you should just know better. We should not have to tell you <laughs> that you shouldn't tie somebody up, swing them from the ceiling, and light his boots on fire. There's some things we're doing. You don't have to go to the Bible. What does it say in the Bible? You should know better. You should just know better. So here's my challenge for you this morning. I want you to come. If you want to live for Jesus and you need some strength and you need some help for him to take you to that next level, this altar should be just lined up. Help me. Because he's not finished with me yet. He's not finished with anybody in this room. For some, he's just getting started. For others, he's ready to take you to the 20-yard to the line. He's ready to take you just deeper and deeper. Who's that going to be? Today is an awesome day when we put this song on. We start to sing, come, kneel before God, talk to him, ask him, surrender to him, and get ready for the roller coaster ride of your life. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning and this time together. I thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your never-ending love. Oh, Lord, forgive me for my emotional outbursts sometimes. We're all in this together, and we need you. The, the world needs us to be that holy priesthood, to be that royal priesthood, that, that holy nation, the answer to their problem. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.